Hi, this is Don Cusick with The Music Biz, and today my guest is Ken Irwin, who is one of the co-founders of Rounder Records. Ken, whatever made you decide to start a record label? I think it was back quite a while ago. Um, we used to go and uh, hear groups around, and we liked them a whole lot, and looked for records, and there weren't any, or there. Um, we got all the ones that existed and couldn't find any more. And back in those days, they had postcards inside a lot of the records on Folkways and Electra and the other folk labels of the time. And um, Prestige, I think, also had them. And they would say, who would you like to see a record by? And we would fill out the card and send it in, and nothing would happen. And uh, then uh, one year, we were hitchhiking down to a fiddler's convention. And on the way back, I got picked up by Ken Davidson, who used to run uh, Kanawa Records from uh, West Virginia. And I stayed with him for a few days and met some of his artists, Clark Kessinger and Billy Cox and mm -hmm. um, a few others. And I saw the way that he operated and how he lived, and I figured if he could do it, then we could. Now, we is Marion Layton, Bill Nolan, and yourself. Right, although at the time it wasn't really uh -huh. uh, Bill had been my undergraduate roommate, and I didn't know Marion at the time, but it's just something, a thought that came to mind, and uh -huh. when it came back, I sort of mentioned it to Bill, and later on I met Marion. You were teaching in, in the Boston area at the time, weren't you? Um, I was still a student at the time when uh -huh. we first got the idea, and uh, in fact, uh, all of us were students, and uh, I guess I went off to uh, graduate school at uh, Cornell, and Bill was still at graduate school in Chicago, or in, uh, later at Tufts. And uh, we started out pretty much when we were long distance from each other. Mm -hmm. What artists did you start with? Uh, the Spark Gap Wonder Boys and George Pegram. Uh -huh. And, and what year was this? 1970. Okay. Could I ask how much capital you had to start with? Very little. Um, <laughs> at that point, I think each of the first two records cost in the neighborhood of $750 to put out. Mm -hmm. Now, is that production cost and pressing? That's, uh, I think, well, production cost on Spark Up Wonder Boys was virtually nil. It was the cost of tape, mm -hmm. as we did that in a, in a um, um, I think it was the WHRB, the Harvard radio station. Mm -hmm. And uh, the George Pegram was a tape that already existed that um, was recorded, which we bought for $125. And what so it was basically, it was, it was about $1,500 so we put the first two records out with. So what did you do after you put them out? Then, then what? Well, it was interesting. We went to the stores in the area uh -huh. and we said, here are two records, we'd like you to carry them. And they looked at us and said, who's your distributor? And we said that we were. And they asked, what else do you carry? And we said, that's it. And he said, well, come back when you have a distributor. And we went back a little bit upset and discouraged and um, decided, hmm, uh, we know these other labels that exist. There are only a few records that don't have a distributor in the area. We called up the other labels and said, how would you like to have a distributor in the Boston area? And they were all excited and said, sure, especially since at the time we paid cash for all the records and they had nothing to, to lose. We went back to the stores and said, you know, we're rounder distributors and these are the labels we carry. And um, they said, okay, and they <laughs> bought the records. <laughs> How did you get I mean, this is all, everything's backwards here. Yeah. <laughs> How did you get national distribution uh, across the whole country, outside of the Boston area? Well, there were a few other distributors who we knew about that um, that already existed. Um, there was one in Northern California that bought 25 of each record, and we thought, you know, that was heaven, um, and paid for them, mm -hmm. which is something that, you know, we found out later is rather the exception. Uh, I was going to ask you that. Yeah. How do you get paid? How did you get paid on uh, in a distribution network when? Well, initially, I guess people were kind to us. Uh huh. Uh, later on, it was a little bit more difficult. <laughs> um, but we started off with just a few distributors, and we had uh, pressed up 500 of each of the two records and uh, made some more covers, I believe, uh, maybe a thousand covers of each. And um, other people told us about other distributors, and some of them took the records. Uh, there was a 
uh, a mail order company, uh, County, which also put out records mm -hmm. that ordered some of each. And uh, there was a distributor out in Colorado who ordered some. And uh, we just started out with a minimal number. And then as we got more records and we found out about more distributors, um, we just got mm -hmm. together with the, with the other companies. When did the label become profitable? Because you're talking at a very small scale here. When did you <laughs> become like a big label? Well, we didn't take any salaries for the first five years. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't think we've ever become like a big label, but uh, well, at least you've got a lot more records there. Yeah, yeah, that's that's true. Um, we didn't take salaries for about the first five years. Uh, we all lived um, communally, the three mm -hmm. of us, in a series of apartments, and finally a house. The first place we lived was uh, um, we refer to it as a no-bedroom apartment. There were whole mm -hmm. bunches of alcoves, mm -hmm. and um, lots of record shelves and a couple of bookshelves and things of that nature. And then we outgrew that after we had uh, about six records out and all the boxes mm -hmm. were um, put in the apartment and pretty soon they were starting to fill up the kitchen as well as the uh, rooms that you had been allocated for records and mm -hmm. going into our uh, um, bedroom alcoves as well. So when did you get an office? Um, well, we moved, we finally um, bought a house after, I think, three warehouses in, mm -hmm. uh, in rental spots, and uh, we figured that would take care of us forever. By then, we probably were distributing about 100 labels, and we were selling not only to the distributors, but we were selling to other stores in other parts of the country. Um, there were a couple of people in stores locally who were very helpful. We had mm -hmm. uh, one of the managers of Discount Records in our market really loved what we were doing and Discount Records had about a hundred stores and he'd take in whole bunches of stores and ship them to the other stores around the country. And um, there was a small chain of record stores that was opening in the south called Record Bar. Mm -hmm. And at the time that we had about four records, they had about four stores. And <laughs> we each grew. It seemed that they were able to, they were moving a little bit quicker. They opened mm -hmm. a store almost every time we put out a record. And um, they were very helpful initially, too. And so we were selling to um, people outside of our area as well as our own. Mm -hmm. But uh, soon the records started to uh, increase, and uh, they we filled up our whole basement, which is where we were working at that time. It was um, we were still operating as a, a living, working collective at that point, mm -hmm. and um, what we would do, we'd get up in the morning and go downstairs and have breakfast, and then we'd all go down into the basement and fill whatever orders or do whatever needed doing. And then we'd come upstairs and have lunch, and then go back downstairs after lunch. And uh, then one person would come up, whose ever turn it was to cook dinner, and cook mm -hmm. dinner for the three of us, or if we had anybody else who was coming by and helping work. Um, and we'd then everybody would go their own way at night. How, about, uh, how did you decide on new acts? or the acts you signed and put records out? What, what made you decide to do a record on these people? Um, There's always communal decisions, as mm -hmm. it is today. It's still the same three people after mm -hmm. whatever it is, close to 17 years. And we just have discussions as to mm -hmm. uh, if we like their music. Um, later on, it became important how we got along with them. Mm -hmm. And uh, later on still, it became important to see that we would at least break even and hopefully make money. Mm -hmm. Your um, A and R decisions—they weren't based on somebody coming to you as a lawyer or a manager saying, "I've got this act." Um, I don't think we heard from a lawyer probably for our first, you know, yeah. eight or nine years. <laughs> so, so you were dependent upon hearing these musicians out, or other, Largely, mu other during musicians the telling you about them? Or? During the summer, um, we would go in our VW bus, and we would go to bluegrass festivals, and we would set up um, tables. Mm -hmm. um, tables, uh, I think, is maybe a uh, slightly inappropriate word. We usually had boxes, and they were mm -hmm. the cardboard boxes that the records came in that we cut up and mm -hmm. made uh, appropriate so people could look through them. And uh, then we'd get to the festival as early as we could, and we would find something that we could make a table. It'd usually be some old, um, old pieces of wood, and um, sometimes we'd put them up on uh, 
on the back of, uh, of the wagon. I remember at uh, Galax one year we couldn't find anything to put them on, so we, uh, we found some old bales of hay and we piled them all up and put our record boxes on top. Which is a little bit difficult when it started raining and it yeah. <laughs> we took them off, but our bales stayed wet the whole weekend. Um, but we just made do with whatever, whatever we could. Well, you've During grown a lot since then. How, how many people do you have at the label now? Well, the label, it's still, I mean, artists or people working for us? No, no, no I mean, just us? people working for you. Well, it's, a, it's about 30, but it's different operations. We have uh, the mail order, mm -hmm. um, which at this point probably has about six or seven people, and it's Roundup Records. And the mail order tries to reach people who either can't find records um, in their stores or um, there are a large number of people who just don't like to go to record stores anymore, mm -hmm. that um, the music is played so loud or the selection is so bad mm -hmm. that, um, that they prefer to buy by mail. Then there's a distribution company which has grown to about 300 labels um, and probably about 15,000 different, different records that we distribute, uh, records, tapes, and mm -hmm. compact discs. Um, and then there's the label. So there are the three three different operations, basically. Now, you are still basically a folk and bluegrass label. Is that correct? Would that be fair in saying that? Um, I think it would be limiting. Uh -huh. We also have put out a number of um, African musics. We have um, a children's series. Um, we've been doing a lot of New Orleans music, uh, mm -hmm. leaning towards what well, we've done, uh, a number of jazz records down there, a number of things that are uh, closer to uh, soul and R&B. Of course, George Thorogood. Yeah. And basically what, what we like is a term that came from, uh, I think, Pete Welding, uh, who referred to us as a label concentrating on roots musics and, its, and their alternative, and their hmm, roots musics and their contemporary offshoots. Yeah. Let me, okay, let me ask you about folk. How do you promote and sell folk albums or folk music? Um, contemporary folk artists or? Yeah, a current, a current folk artist. Mm -hmm. how, how do you go about getting them known and getting the record out and getting it to the customers? Well, we have a uh, significant uh, mailing list mm -hmm. of radio stations who play folk music, um, press, um, so that's the initial step is the mailing. We do occasional advertising in the folk related publications. We work with the artists um, as they tour, uh, contacting press or radio, uh, trying to set up uh, interviews where possible, sending um, photos and press kits mm -hmm. down to the press, um, usually surrounding a date. Um, we'll call a lot of the people. We're working very closely with National Public Radio, mm -hmm. um, which has been a, a real boon to the, the folk music world. Um, we try to, wherever possible, find um, openings for um, any of our artists who might be able to reach a larger audience through performing with people in other areas. Mm -hmm. um, we keep in close contact with most of the clubs that are booking folk music. Do you sell a lot in retail record stores, folk music? Um, in certain stores. Uh -huh. Is it most of the mom and pop, the independent stores? It depends on the artist. Um, the, mom, the moms and pops still are the most supportive stores. Mm -hmm. um, but there are a number of chains that have been very good. Um, certainly Tower Records has been a very, very strong supporter mm -hmm. of folk music. Um, Generally, when they open up a store, they carry virtually everything that's in print and then weed things down mm -hmm. um, after a while. But that's while. kind of the exception. Tower Records is an exception in the, mm -hmm. in the industry. I mean, there, there are other, other chains that are supportive, but mm -hmm. uh, it does seem to be a narrowing uh, area in the stores. How about, how about the mail, the catalogs? Um, does that account for a significant amount of sales for folk? I think uh, growing, and it certainly will be uh, mm -hmm. an increasing amount between our own mail order and there are three or four other strong mail orders around the country that, uh, that emphasize folk strongly. Is the sales or success of a folk act mainly dependent upon live performances or is it airplay in, in stores or something I think else? it's mostly the touring, but uh, if you can, the ideal is to do everything in conjunction. Mm -hmm. And if you have an act that is touring, that is willing to meet the press, to do radio interviews, et cetera, that's when things uh, happen best. Mm -hmm. So if you have an act that doesn't tour, you're really at a loss with a, fo with a folk act? 
Well, we can we can still get some radio. We mm -hmm. still get a lot of print. Print isn't uh, isn't quite as difficult on a non-touring act as radio is. Mm -hmm. um, it seems that that print is not. Um, they don't depend on their living for from the record companies. Mm -hmm. The reviewers seem to be able to write whatever they want, where radio is seems to always be looking over their shoulder to seeing who's going to advertise, where the, the papers don't depend mm -hmm. on revenues from uh, record advertising. Do you have a profile of, of a folk music buyer? Is there a certain kind of person that you see over and over again that, that, that buys folk music? Because I, I, my image is the back to basics person, the the 19th century lifestyle type person, the uh, you know t to get a stereotype, the plaid shirt and the jeans with the log cabin in the back <laughs> and the herbal tea and things like that. Is is that the folk music buyer? Um, in our area, I would say it's closer to uh, to the yuppies. Mm -hmm. It's the people who were around uh, 20 years ago during the last folk revival, and. Uh, they had the Newport Folk Festival the last two years. That's who came out. It certainly mm -hmm. wasn't the people that you're referring to. How hard is it to make a living playing folk music? How hard is it for a folk well, artist to make a living? Well, I've never been able to do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I asked Hazel yeah. uh, Dickens that, and she said, oh, yes, you could do it. If you play lots of festivals. But mm -hmm. Well, not just festivals. There are numbers of coffee houses. Mm -hmm. um, the most difficult thing is that there are very, very few good booking agents. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's probably similar to lots of other businesses that people are reluctant to get involved in a situation until the money is very obvious. Mm -hmm. And so there's a real void in the area of the people who were starting out and um, a good booking agent could um, make a very, very nice living if they didn't go looking straight to the top and look for the stars mm -hmm. and, and try to find good solid acts who are willing to tour, who um, make good music and who look like they're going to be around for a while. Does this mean a lack of professionalism in that, in that part of the industry? That it's hard to find the good PR people, promotion people, lawyers, agents, all, booking agents, all down the line? Well, I think it's, it's less um, professionalism than that people just don't want to, st to start out with an act. They want to wait um, the same way that a major label does mm -hmm. until an artist has developed to a certain point, and then they'll be glad to work with them, where they're usually much more reluctant to start and just take, um, take a shot at somebody without having anything behind them. Mm -hmm. You mentioned putting, you know, helping your acts with booking and helping them with press kits and this sort of thing. Do you find in folk and bluegrass a lack of, oh, I don't want to say professionalism, maybe professional ambition or awareness with, with the folk and bluegrass acts on getting all this stuff together and promoting themselves? And I would separate the folk and bluegrass. Mm -hmm. A lot of the folk acts that we work with are, are very, very professional. Mm -hmm. um, they also are often um, a different generation. Um, again, when you're talking about folk, uh, contemporary folk versus traditional folk, mm -hmm. um, the traditional folk and the bluegrass might be lumped together. Whereas the contemporary folk, a lot of the artists we're dealing with are highly skilled in um, in booking, uh, in promotion, in publicity. Um, a number of them are, have been on television, have been uh, interviewed by major press, you mm -hmm. know, Newsweek, Time, people like that. What's what's you the know. difference there w between the contemporary and traditional? Traditional are doing. Barbara Allen and <laughs> those kinds of songs? or um, Most of the um, contemporary are singer-songwriters or um, people who are doing writing more about today and usually about an urban mm -hmm. um, situation or an international situation where the traditional are either um, doing traditional songs or writing about situations where where they grew up mm -hmm. um, in in the mountains or or elsewhere mm -hmm. you mentioned uh, there's a difference between folk and bluegrass so let's let's talk about bluegrass how do you promote bluegrass and sell blue, uh, bluegrass where where is that sold how do you get that out um, I think it's largely uh, there are two different areas, one being in the south, in fact, largely southeast, mm -hmm. and the other being on, on and around college campuses. Um, 
as far as selling it, it's largely, um, I'd say a, a significant part is through mail order there. Mm -hmm. Um, stores are, at least up in the Northeast, Midwest, and West, are not really very open to carrying much bluegrass. And you'll find that the people who are interested know n much more about it than the people in the stores. In the South, there's still quite a few places where you can find good stocks of bluegrass, but that's even, even being cut down. Um, promotionally, again, we have a mailing list that we've built up over, mm -hmm. you know, the 15 or 16 years. Um, we know most of the press who are interested and willing to review, and we send them copies. Um, we work with the artists that we can. Very often in bluegrass, we don't even get itineraries from the artists. Mm -hmm. And so we'll occasionally get a call from a distributor um, or a paper or a radio station saying, you know, such and such a group was just here, you know, why didn't you tell us? And mm -hmm. we have to call up the group and say, could you please let us know, you know, that where you're going because mm -hmm. we can help. Um, but there the level of professionalism is, uh, is way, way behind the group's performance level where why? they can be quite professional. Why would that be? Is it just not hip to be that? Uh, no, I don't think yeah. it's anything to do with, with being hip. I think they just don't, that there are role models that they can see when they go to a festival and they mm -hmm. can see how you're supposed to act. Mm -hmm. um, and there are three or four different possible ways of dressing and they decide which one they want to do and, um, and they can do that. Mm -hmm. And they know that, um, that their job once they get on stage is to entertain and they do that and they can, mm -hmm. you know, they, they have people that they can discuss things with. But again, um, I think it's largely because of the finances that there aren't people who are very interested outside of the music who want to be involved because it isn't a, a great way to make a living managing a bluegrass group. Mm -hmm. You know, if you had had enough, you could, you could do it. And uh, most of the musicians just haven't, haven't gotten involved, although there is a new organization that's um, developed in the last couple of years. It's um, IBMA, um, the they International Bluegrass in Music. Yeah. yeah, and they're starting, uh, they had their first meetings in Owensboro this year, and there'll be a, a bigger one next year. And the main emphasis really is to try to um, make bluegrass uh, overall much more um, professional and known to, uh, you know, to the outside world. Mm -hmm. Uh, the bluegrass pickers open to that. I oh, the majority of them yeah. are. You know, they're they're when we discuss things with them, they're just uh, they're just amazed that there are all these other opportunities that they don't know about. They uh, most of the booking agents are very narrow in their contacts. Mm -hmm. They are great at booking bluegrass festivals, but they don't know they don't have contacts outside of them, mm -hmm. and. Uh, they don't really know very much about the outside world. There are very few booking agents or managers who are handling all different types of acts, and as a re result, uh, those people have a better perspective, you know, mm -hmm. when they can see what's going on. You talked about selling uh, records at festivals. Is that still a major source of record sales? It is, festivals? but not for us. Mm -hmm. um, Why not for you? Um, there aren't too many festivals up our way, and if we were to get into our vehicle pick all the records, load them up, drive a full day down to a festival, be there for two or three days, and then come back. We're really taking about six days away from work, mm -hmm. and it's not, um, it's not really productive for us in, if you consider what we could be doing if mm -hmm. we were back at the office. You, you basically gave a profile of the, of the folk music buyer as more of the yuppie. What about the, the bluegrass buyer? What kind of person is this? Um, I definitely see uh, college mm -hmm. as uh, college students or ex-college students, certainly people who are um, learning or, or playing instruments, and uh, then an awful lot of, um, of Southern people. And mm -hmm. there I think it's both young and old. I think uh, a large part of the population that I see at Southern festivals are people in their 40s, 50s, even 60s. Um, and occasionally older who go out and just love the music. They bring their lawn chairs and, and sit out there. Mm -hmm. Do you, uh, wh what, is a, what is a successful album uh, in terms of sales for folk and for bluegrass? 
It depends on how much money you um, mm -hmm. put into it. No, but it. I mean, I mean, when sales, what, what can what can you generally expect from a folk album? And I know there's no such thing as an average folk right, album. Right, that's what I was going to say. Um, but what are you looking at? I mean, you're not looking gold and platinum, obviously. No. You're not looking at a hundred thousand. Are you looking at twenty thousand? Um, it's it's possible to sell um, that many of a good folk album. Mm -hmm. Is it more like ten thousand though? It depends on the artist. Mm -hmm. um, we've uh, Nancy Griffith has done. She's probably in the twenty-five thousand mm -hmm. range now, and her records have been along the, the folk lines. Um, she's going to be going a, a bit more in a country direction, but mm -hmm. uh, it is possible. There are other acts. Uh, I would think that um, records like The Celtic Harp by Alan Stavell, um, which we licensed after it had been out for about 10 years, it's probably sold about 50,000. Mm -hmm. um, David Grisman record has sold over 50,000. His record on Kaleidoscope, which mm -hmm. is a label that we distribute in our area, is over 100,000. Um, so it is, it is possible to do that well. Mm -hmm. how, about, how about Bluegrass? What sales range are you looking at there? Um, 3,000 to 30 or 40,000 if something I is really exceptional. That, I always think of that quote from the Osborne Brothers, there's 11,000 bluegrass fans because every time we put out an album it sells, sells 11,000. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, there's a traditional versus contemporary argument in bluegrass. Do you try to play both sides of the fence? Do you have traditional acts? Do you have contemporary acts? We're basically traditional. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> It's unusual in that we we've been we were one of the forerunners in an area um, which is sometimes called new acoustic music, which is a lot of the younger pickers who have gone way mm -hmm. beyond um, the confines of bluegrass and are experimenting with jazz and other forms, and then we do traditional bluegrass. But our our I think our aesthetic is to have something which um, which moves us in one way or another, and. Mm -hmm that middle ground of bluegrass, which is um, a little bit on the bland and folky side, doesn't, um, doesn't do very much for us. Mm -hmm. And we've stayed, um, as far as our bluegrass, very much on the traditional side. Who's your competition? The, uh, I know Sugar Hill's doing a lot of that contemporary bluegrass. But who else is putting out folk and bluegrass albums? Are there a lot of labels? Or? There are probably a hundred labels that do something, uh -huh. and since we're so broad in what we do, um, we have different competitors in different fields. In different music. fields, yeah. yeah. Um, I don't think there's any one label. Um, of late, the major labels have probably been our biggest competition, um, picking up a lot of artists that we've mm -hmm. that we've developed. Nancy Griffith is an example there, mm -hmm. isn't she? Yeah. Um, what configurations are selling? Uh, is the vinyl still selling? Are cassettes selling? Are, are the the, vinyl, is there any CDs? Vinyl still sells um, quite well for us. Cassettes mm -hmm. um, have never been as strong as they have been for the major labels in terms of mm -hmm. rock and roll releases. And the compact discs we have are starting out very well. We just, you know, there it hasn't been enough time mm -hmm. to really tell how well they're going to do. Do you have a breakdown there? Is it, is it dominated by vinyl? For us, it's dominated by vinyl. Uh, what rough percentage on uh, cassette? Um, maybe 20 for us. It's almost a reversal of what the majors do. I was going to say, because, well, I know I was talking to a gospel person, and, and it's 80-20 cassette mm -hmm. over everything else. Yeah. Why, is, why did your market never get into cassettes? <laughs> um, a lot of it isn't, uh, well, it's certainly not... Um, I think a lot of it is stuff that people need to listen to a little bit more closely. And the cassette market, in many cases, is stuff that you can sort of bring and not listen to um, quite music. as carefully. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure if that's if How that's about the CDs? How, how far have you gotten into CDs? Well, we have about 20 that are released at this point. Mm -hmm. And what we've been trying to do is to get a, f a really broad range. We have um, a reggae CD, we've had a couple of bluegrass CDs, we've had folk CDs. Um, we're sort of testing, testing the markets and in addition trying to be the first or among the first in lots of these areas so that if anybody wants a folk CD, they will mm -hmm. get um, Christine Lavin or they'll mm -hmm. get John McCutcheon or they'll get Nancy Griffith. 
Um, initial reactions? Initial re well, they're going out. We just, as mm -hmm. I said, it's been too soon to know if they'll come back and return uh, six months from now or a year from now. How about videos? Have you, have you done any videos or is that? No, no. Any appeal there? Um, if someone else would finance it, we'd be glad to. Mm -hmm. Well, most of the major labels are doing that. Uh, you know, telling the artist to basically finance yeah. and distribute it. Uh, have you had any artists interested in in doing any of that? In terms of videos to sell or just for MTV? Uh, well, uh, Network how about or? concerts? Uh, you know, concerts have been, they're going more for the longer videos rather than yeah. the three-minute movie. We've had uh, one artist who did his own. Mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a group in, in Austin, Texas that have been doing a lot of uh, mm -hmm a lot of performance shows and they did one and uh, it's it's something that we'll probably be interested in at a later time but mm -hmm. you know it's right now we've just been devoting a lot of our energy to keep up and keeping up and catching up with the compact disc mm -hmm. situation what I hear you saying this is really no market for an outlet for videos in in folk or bluegrass I think there's probably very little at this point mm -hmm. the uh, the bluegrass buyer is not one for the most part, who's going to be spending thirty or forty dollars um, for for one piece? And up till now, excuse me, the videos that have been done have mm -hmm. not been up to the level that would be uh, something that we'd want to get involved in. It's just at too an exploratory period. I also hear you saying that your market has stuck with the uh, traditional lineup of basically vinyl. Uh, is it? Do you think it reflects maybe traditional values in your, in your audience, or is it hard to or jump finances. to that conclusion? Traditional finances. <laughs> <laughs> Could be. Uh huh. Um, I mean, we had an interesting situation where we've asked a number of our groups to ask at their concerts about uh, how many people had CDs, and a couple people raised their hand, and turned out they were talking about the bank CDs. Yeah. <laughs> so I think I think that bluegrass in particular will be safe for quite a while. It'll be a vinyl market for a number of years. Uh -huh. um, the folk I think will move a lot quicker because I think it is a um, an audience that is better off financially, and so they'll be much quicker to to y get into CDs. You mentioned that you distribute labels, and you said you distribute how many labels now? Um, well, on a regional basis, about 300 labels. Now, do you basically limit your distribution company to the Northeast region? It's mainly New York and New England, mm -hmm. but we do fill in gaps. If a store comes to us from, uh, from Oklahoma and says, you know, I usually deal with um, a particular distributor and they're a fine distributor for us and we have a real good relationship, but they don't carry 150 of the labels that you carry and I can't seem to find them anyplace else, mm -hmm. then we'll be glad to sell them. If they call up and say, uh, this distributor won't sell us because we owe them money, which they probably won't tell us, <laughs> yeah. um, then we'll be reluctant or we can just steer them on to the other distributor and if they call back, um, then, we can, then we can check on it. How many, how many distributors are there in the country that are major distributors? You, you talk about county. Dave uh, Freeman. Well, they're a, they're a major distributor for us, but mm -hmm. our most of the major distributors don't even know who they are. Mm -hmm. How about on the West Coast? Do you have some folk and uh, and bluegrass distributors out there? There are two major distributors. One of which also handles all the dance music. Mm -hmm. When I say dance music for down here, um, you know that's the um, rap music and black dance mm -hmm. music rather than square dance music. <laughs> 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 uh, now, what does distribution mean wh when you say you distribute labels? You put these in your catalog, you ship them to the stores. Do well, you we have salespeople oh. on the phone speaking to stores. We have salespeople in our own area who are actually going into the stores, taking inventory, showing the new releases, mm -hmm. um, talking to the buyers and tell them why they should carry this particular mm -hmm. record. Do you do any POP material? Uh, for stores? Not a whole lot. We've tried in some cases. Um, we did quite a bit on the uh, New Orleans series mm -hmm. um, and had a fair amount of success. What's happening there is that most stores are charging for space and the major labels will come in and in effect buy the space and so if we have something and we're not willing to to give them uh, records or uh, or money 
Mm -hmm. then you know it's very hard to compete unless you run into somebody in the store who just loves what you're doing and now are you talking uh, mainly about uh, chain stores and mall outlets here uh, largely although some of the moms and pas are I mean mm -hmm. everybody's looking for a way to make money and uh, if they feel that they can make the money um, doing that and not compromise their goals mm -hmm. then they'll likely do it how about in-store contest? That was always a great way to get get POP stuff up. Did, did you ever do any of those? Or? We've done a couple. We're doing one right now with a um, grand prize of a, a free trip to uh, New Orleans for the uh, Jazz and Heritage Festival. Mm -hmm. yeah. Your um, audience, you reach your audience through print quite a bit. Mm -hmm. uh, how about through radio? You said there are some, some folk uh, stations? Well, through um, college radio college is still radio? fairly mm -hmm. fairly open. Um, the national uh, public radio is very open. Mm -hmm. um, most of the rest of radio is extremely tight, whether it's country or pop or rock and roll mm -hmm. or easy listening. Um, you know, there it's situation again, something like. Uh, we were talking before with booking agents that if radio stations would go into a market and say, I'd like to be number three and I'm going to do what I want to do, they'd have a very, very good chance of doing it. Mm -hmm. um, but most of them go in and try to be number one and that means doing what number one is doing um, with maybe some minor, minor adjustment, playing seven songs in a row instead of six songs in a row or whatever. What about television? Yeah, that's for television, bluegrass and, got, and uh, folk. Well, it's uh, largely irrelevant to us at this point. Um, there was Fire on the Mountain on the Nashville Network, and that seems to be no more. Um, occasionally, we get an artist on the Nashville Network, and um, it's been helpful. Like Nancy Griffith did, uh, got quite a bit of coverage on Once in a Very Blue Moon, and a number of artists have um, been on one or the other of uh, shows, especially the bluegrass groups. Mm -hmm. um, uh, recently, the Dirty Dozen Brass Band was on Johnny Carson's show, and that was real nice. But it's the exception rather than the rule. How about uh, packaging? I noticed that your albums come out with very attractive covers and good okay. liner notes. And uh, is packaging important in, in that market? Well, we take pride in it. I don't know mm -hmm. how much relevance it has. We usually uh, um, fight with the artist to get liner notes on. A lot of people sort of get tired after their fourth album. You know, what more can you say? Mm -hmm. But we've always felt that if a radio station is going to play something and they can talk about a record for 30 seconds more, that that's a help. Or if they talk mm -hmm. about it for two minutes longer, or if someone who's writing an article uh, has a little bit more information, or maybe there'll be something in the liner notes that mm -hmm. will key them into a different way of seeing things than they were, then that's worth it too. Is there any way you, you can determine if it's helped sales or, or do you get feedback no. from consumers? We get, we get feedback, not necessarily that they bought it, but that they really, that they really like it. Mm -hmm. And we also all come from academic backgrounds and we just always were interested in, um, in learning more about the records that we had and we were disappointed when there wasn't enough information on the back. So, you know, mm -hmm. a lot of that is something that that we specifically mm -hmm. like doing and like seeing on other records. Is there a folk revival in this country? I hear in this country, yes, but it might be only in the Northeast. Um, there are promoters up in the Northeast that are fighting amongst each other for acts, for venues. Um, the, the major folk clubs are being hurt because their acts are elevating to concert acts and uh, it's, it's sort of comparable to what happens with the major labels and the small labels where the mm -hmm. small clubs build an artist up and then the pr big promoters come in and, you know, and start playing them at big halls. Mm -hmm. But there's an awful lot of interest and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of radio airplay in, in our area. How about the rest of the country? Hotbed. Um, there are other areas, and I, I think that you don't notice it quite so much down here in that anybody who might be considered a folk artist who lives in Nashville is not called a folk artist, but is called a singer-songwriter. Mm -hmm. And we've signed a couple people from this area and have a couple other people who we want to sign who we are signing more as folk artists or singer-songwriters, but um, once they get away from Nashville, I think they'll be viewed as singer-songwriters writers or contemporary folk acts. Mm -hmm. Is it uh, a good time to start an independent label now? I mean, looking, looking at your life, if you could do it over again, would, would now be as good a time as it was in 70? Definitely not. Mm -hmm. Why not? 
because um, there's there's been a lot of discussion of late um, about black vinyl death, mm -hmm. which is the end of the LP. Um, people saying within a year to five years to ten years, whatever, mm -hmm. and if that's going to happen, then the two main um, types of music will be on either cassette or on compact disc. And compact disc cost about five or six times the amount that an album costs to make. Mm -hmm. And it will greatly limit not only for, um, for new companies, um, but also for companies that are in existence. It'll be a real question for us on a new act if we'll be able to afford to be able to take chances mm -hmm. on an unknown act um, on, a, on a CD. How can vinyl die if your area is still depending upon it? Because the major labels are where most of the finances are. Mm -hmm. And if they push it, then the radio stations will push it, then the advertising will push it. Um, there are a number of chains already that are not taking in records mm -hmm. that will only be carrying cassettes and, and CDs. And this is, I think it's real premature, but that's the direction that they've chosen to go. Mm -hmm. And if the major labels push it, that's, that's where they'll go. Have you had any success in doing a compilation album uh, with new acts in folk or bluegrass, you know, Featuring them on a cut or two. Uh, we've to done break we've that. done that. The most successful has been in the area of new acoustic music, mm -hmm. where we did a record called the New Acoustic Music Sampler, and at that point um, there wasn't really much of a term new acoustic music. It was just starting out, mm -hmm. and we did a 398 list um, LP um, with I think it was 14 or 16 cuts from most of the leaders in the new acoustic music mm -hmm. field. And we've sold between fifteen and 20,000 copies of that. Um, and we do know that a number of stores have told us that shortly after someone bought that, they came in within two days or within a week and bought eight or nine records from mm -hmm. different artists on the record. So mm -hmm. it did have some kind of impact, um, certainly not as much as we would have hoped. Mm -hmm. um, and we did have one um, negative effect, and that is that uh, major labels or labels distributed by major labels have signed about four or five of the acts <laughs> from our sampler. <laughs> so we did a very functional thing for the majors. And yeah in showcasing our acts. <laughs> well, the, the reason I asked that, because it would lead in to the obvious question about CDs. Uh, uh, if, if your industry goes in that direction, would there be more sample albums, or would there be more? Well, we've done a number albums? already. We've mm -hmm. done a reggae sampler. We've done a folk sampler. We've done the new acoustic music sampler. We've done a blues-oriented sampler called mm -hmm. Out of the Blue. And we're talking about several others. Um, the thing is that it's at this point with the price of compact discs being so high, it's hard to do a budget. Mm -hmm. And people are be less likely, I believe, to sample something that, that would be the same cost as a regular record. Mm -hmm. um, what are your major costs in, 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 in running a label? Production, obviously. The, the label part, certainly um, production, making mm -hmm. the records. Um, mastering, warehousing, um, there are other costs such as uh, trying to collect bills and mm -hmm. the money that's actually out in the distributor's hands that they owe you and the time it takes to, um, mm -hmm. to collect that money, um, accountants. Is it hard to collect money from distributors? It's hard if you don't have something that they, that they want. Mm -hmm. We've um, found ourselves in a fairly good position as the previous largest independents have largely gone on to be majors mm -hmm. or distributed by the majors. So five years ago, there was Motown, Arista, um, mm -hmm. Chrysalis were all going through independence, and they were the priority labels in terms of um, attention and payment, and now they're all with the majors, and what has to happen is that the um, distributors mm -hmm. go downward and look for where else they can uh, make their money, and they go to the, um, to the next batch of labels. And no, so well, we're f a fairly much of a priority label now, but I would not um, I would not feel very good about being a label with two records or three records right now. Let me ask an, an obvious question. Have you thought about uh, being distributed by a major? 
We've done something which uh, is just in its infancy stages, and that is um, that we've started a new label called Rounder EMI, which is distributed through EMI. Um, at this point, we have one record out, um, a rock and roll group called uh, True Believers, and um, we're just finishing up a record by the Neville Brothers, and um, we're talking seriously about a couple other records. Mm -hmm. But we don't feel that a major label could take the majority of our catalog and have the faintest idea. Uh, they w they just, it would be mm -hmm. a disaster. But um, yeah, they've taken a lot of your, your acts. Right, but not directly through us. Yeah. Is this, uh, does this mean that you don't have as ironclad a contract as the major labels do with your ex? <laughs> well, we generally don't try to, haven't tried to sign people mm -hmm. for, um, for a lifetime. Mm -hmm. um, we felt that we wanted to have enough periods so that if we were able to build them up and they did go on, that, um, that we would still be in good shape and that we would both benefit, but that um, in most cases we don't feel that we could do as good a job and we don't feel that the independent distribution network could do quite the job on a hit type record. Mm -hmm. On catalog records we feel the independent distribution network can probably do a better job than the majors. So what are the future plans for Rounder? To just keep on what you're doing? Stay with the independents? Yeah. And if we find records that we feel would benefit from a branch distribution then we would mm -hmm. uh, we would consider it as a possible EMI project. Mm -hmm. And if records, uh, if EMI is not interested, then we would uh, approach another label. And you're still going to continue to distribute labels in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. And uh, how about finding talent? How are, you, how are you finding talent today? Well, we come down here and <laughs> <laughs> we come down so here and there. The streets, we, yeah. listen, we listen to every, every demo that, uh, that comes in, although we usually don't find a whole lot through that mm -hmm. route. Um, we do go to clubs. We have lots of friends um, who tell us about different acts. Um, we occasionally hear from some of the other artists that we're working with. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we had a group that opened for us and blew us off the stage. Um, or we, s we saw mm -hmm. this neat group who we think has a lot of potential. And uh, occasionally groups or artists that we're working with even want to produce um, mm -hmm. another act. And um, we read newspapers, and uh, we don't listen to radio that much. We don't hear too many new mm -hmm. acts on, on the radio, how nor many, does anybody. Yeah, how many acts does uh, Rounder have now, roughly? We have about 600, 650 records that are out. Um, as far as touring acts, there are probably 15 to 20 that are really touring most of the year. Mm -hmm. Final question. Did you ever think you'd be in the position you are now? Is this head of a, a label with 650 albums at? No, it certainly out? is not anything uh -huh. that... Um, our, I think when we started out, we wanted to make a couple of classic records. Mm -hmm. And um, we didn't really envision it as a lifetime uh, endeavor, uh, none of the three of us. Do you envision it as a lifetime endeavor now? <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine doing anything else. I could see changing a few of the things, uh, the way that uh -huh. we do things, um, the way that I do things in particular, but... Um, other than that, I would find it hard to find anything that I enjoyed more. Okay. Well, thank you for being on the show. Well, That's Ken Irwin with Rounder Records, mm -hmm. uh, and this is Don Cusick with The Music Biz.